articulated by Judith Butler, um, that if the real Jews are not bad Jews, their adversary must be good guys, good Jews. Right? Because this is a world these people inhabit. It, it's a Manichean world in which there's a kind of moral narcissism uh, that only distinguishes good and evil, isn't capable of distinguishing anything other than two extremes. That's just like the narcissist, but it's a kind of moral narcissism. Uh, and that leads Judith to say that uh, yeah, there are the bad Jews out there. Okay? And so because we have to choose a camp, because everything is a contrast between uh, uh, the good people and the bad people, Hamas and Hezbollah are despite everything. Okay? That's what she says, despite everything. Hamas and Hezbollah, because she recognizes that they're not perfect, but she says Hamas and Hezbollah are social movements that are progressive. They're part of the, quote unquote, they are part of the global left, and hence they're desirable. Henry Urgus, welcome. You are in Paris. Um, Piers Ackerman, you are sitting in Sydney. I'm sitting in Melbourne. Uh, welcome you both. So Henry today is going to be talking to us about anti-Semitism. Um, but before we start in the main subject, perhaps we should go around and talk about Australian politics. What do you think, Piers? Well, I think that the focus is really on US politics at the moment, Albert, um, which is the, the great unknown. Um, as far as Australian politics goes, uh, I'm sure Henry keeps his finger on the pulse from Paris. But what we what we've seen is a um, a, a very lackluster performance from the opposition, uh, failing to to uh, cut through uh, with any of its initiatives, um, as the as there's still the lingering um, stench of the uh, question marks hanging over whether the Prime Minister sought upgradings in a private capacity from uh, uh, Qantas, the national carrier. Um, and, and they've tried to uh, make, make some big announcements about uh, free TAFE courses for people and cutting, reducing the amount of, of uh, student uh, debt to the government, the HEX fee. Um, there's a, a bit of a scandal happening in defence with the Australian government cancelling what was a signature um, a space satellite uh, surveillance system yeah, precise. Uh, of, ma mm. of many billions of dollars. Seven billion um, to be precise, seven billion. Well, and the yeah. student uh, loans that they want to forgive <clears throat> is to the uh, height of $16 billion. That tells you what yes. the problems are. Yes, um, and and the government is um, uh, not not gaining any traction with these, um, it, which but but um, they, they have all the earmarks of um, pre-election uh, sweeteners um, to uh, very discreet sections of the uh, voting public, particularly in terms of the education, mm -hmm. uh, young and and well-educated uh, kids. Um, and and the TAFE to those who are going to pursue trades, um, but the you know the 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 worry of course is in these troubling times that the defence cutbacks do really nothing um, to protect the security of the nation. Yeah, absolutely. Well summarised, appears. So back to you, Henry. And uh, okay. so from Paris, do you follow what's happening in Australia? I guess you must, yes, because especially where you are, you are at the Australian embassy, right? Yes, well, I try to. And obviously, Pierce has a much better sense of what is happening and also of how the public is reacting to it. Yes, that's absolutely. And I think I, well, I know I agree with everything he's just said, mm. um, that there's almost a hint of desperation in some of these initiatives. Isn't that right, Pierce? Well, th that's what I see. And um, 
I haven't seen a uh, a government as as flustered this far out from a an election um, in in my experience, uh, Henry. Uh, we're, we're, as as uh, Albert enumerated, we're talking a, about billions and I mean t- ten to twenty billions of dollars here, um, mm. which is being promised. Now, uh, uh, as always, the fine print shows that many of these initiatives won't take effect until after the next election. So it's very hard to read them in any other way than as election sweeteners. Vote for me, and this is what you'll be getting. Mm. I don't think they're even hiding about that. It is no, quite no. obvious. But there was another declaration about the three months campaigning before the election uh, to do precisely a US style campaign. Have you seen that? Um, I've heard it, um, but I, I think we're all, we, we've already seen a foretaste of that with a town meeting that Albanese held at a uh, uh, South Australian school um, uh, last weekend, um, which was really a an American style uh, village uh, town meeting um, where he announced the uh, hex fees and the TAFE uh, cuts to a selected audience. Um, there is a question, of course, about using uh, school resources to hold uh, for electoral yeah. purposes. And I know that this is now being raised in the South Australian Parliament as to who gave the Labour Party permission to use those premises for for uh, party political purposes. Mm. Yeah. So, so, Henry, um, let's get into the heart of our subject, and that's uh, anti-Semitism. Of course, Australia is certainly not immune, and uh, it's really a, a, a huge rise of anti-Semitism. Two weeks ago, um, on the front page uh, of uh, 3AW, uh, you had the story of the day that was a Monday, was that on the weekend, uh, there were some uh, uh, Muslims patrolling uh, Turak uh, to try to find Jews to kill. That was the headline. And uh, mm-hmm. that ran the entire day. So th- the climate, therefore, uh, it's quite fearful for the Jewish community, as you can imagine. Uh, this happening uh, in, in Turak, I mean, Caulfield already had his, his pound of anti-Semitism over the last uh, year or so since October 7, um, but now it's propagating everywhere. Um, so it will be good, therefore, uh, to hear what you've got to say on the subject. Of course, um, there is an, another, perhaps, uh, contextual uh, 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 subject. Um, first of all, the rise of anti-Semitism seems to be imported directly uh, by those new migrants that come from Muslim countries. Uh, that is true in France, it's true in Europe in general, and it's true here in Australia. There's no two ways about it. I cannot be politically correct about it. That's what is happening. Um, um, And uh, uh, the other issue that is uh, uh, perhaps more fundamental is to see the left um, uh, doing what uh, it does, which is uh, going with extremists, like uh, forming alliances that are incongruent, uh, that are completely nonsensical, uh, where, for instance, uh, they are uh, um, basically uh, getting in bed uh, with uh, Islamofascism. Uh, there's no other way to describe this. And um, of course, the left has been, I'm talking about the extreme left, has been taken over by wokeism. And so you've got all these transformations in the vocabulary, words that used to mean one thing do not mean what they used to. Uh, 
for me, from my generation, I'm uh, I'm a little bit behind the ball because uh, when I hear those young people using that vocabulary, I think they mean one thing, they mean something totally different. So I'm a little bit behind the eyeball uh, with that. But what is your take uh, on on this? Um, like, you know, you've got uh, uh, the, the, the GBTQ plus uh, community um, totally demonstrating for the people of Palestine and more particularly the people of Gaza, but yet we know that if they themselves were to demonstrate uh, in Gaza, uh, we know what would happen to them. Uh, but they would be absolutely safe demonstrating in Tel Aviv or even in Jerusalem, because even Jerusalem has a pride parade, um, but um, certainly try to have a pride parade in Gaza. In fact, here's a good idea. How about they organize one? I'd like to see what happens if they were to organize a pride parade in Gaza. That would be a really interesting experiment. What is your view, dear Henry? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Albert, for inviting me. And thank you, Pierce, for stepping in as a discussant. I appreciate it very much. And um, uh, I, I think that, like everyone else I know, I was surprised and indeed shocked by what happened after October 7, in the sense that, yes, we knew from previous events, the previous Gaza conflicts, the Second Intifada and so on, we knew that every time there was an eruption in, uh, in the region, that it had domestic consequences, that we'd see extremists parading in the streets, and we'd see a great deal of biased reporting. So all that was predictable. But the scale and intensity of those phenomena post October 7th was, to my mind, something new and something deeply troubling and it required some understanding. I think parts of it were uh, more readily understandable than others. And it's important to say that the phenomena we're observing are not entirely uniform and homogenous. As Albert said, what we've witnessed are coalitions, um, in many cases coalitions that seem against nature, as it were, uh, and the parties to those coalitions come from different traditions, they have different origins, they have different, to some extent, worldviews. And so there is an important strand in Australia, as elsewhere, of imported Islamic anti-Semitism. And there's no doubt about that. And nor is there any doubt about why that has become as substantial as it is, um, which is, to my mind, an internal evolution within Islam, compounded by a sense of complacency in governments. And so for a long time, for example, in Australia, the attitude of the security services was Islamic anti-Semitism, well, okay, it's not great, um, we don't like it, but if they're not going out there shooting people, um, that really isn't our concern, and if we try to clamp down on it, they will go out there and shoot people. And so the attitude was to tolerate it and indeed try to build links to those groups. And that's what we saw over a period of 20 years over governments of both from both sides of politics, must be said. And so that was allowed to develop. And that I have no conceptual difficulty understanding. What was more puzzling for me and what I'd like to focus on today was really the anti-Semitism that has emerged on the left. 
And clearly, the left is a very broad category. And there are within it people who are, are very critical of Israel, but not anti-Semitic. Uh, but there is also a very significant strand, particularly in what could be called the harder left, which includes the green left, but is much wider than that, of Judeophobia. And it's important to try to understand that, and that's what I was trying to, that's what I've been thinking about lately and what I'd like to share with you. Um, now, the, uh, uh, the focus I've taken on it, and it's by no means the only way of thinking about it, is to examine more closely what the leading thinkers of that part of the left have had to say about Jews, Judaism, and uh, um, and their relationship to uh, their views of Zionism. And so my analysis is very much an analysis of leading intellectuals rather than an analysis of necessarily the people on the streets. Okay. Um, if, if you asked, asked, I think if I asked you, what do the people who are donning kafias and, and shouting slogans, what, what do they think? I suspect you would say not much. They don't think terribly much. And in a way, you'd be right. They probably, most of them, don't think terribly much and they know even less. But... Um, What's striking is that these people who've gone through our greatly expanded tertiary system in, in Australia, in the US, in the UK, in France, they absorb, perhaps at third hand, they absorb the thinking of those people who are revered as leading intellectuals. And so it's useful to focus on them, recognizing that uh, they are uh, often very difficult to read, they're often very turgid, their work is often jargon-ridden, and so it will only percolate through rather indirectly. Now, what I try to do in the little presentation that I've set out to you is to look at this really beginning from two quotes that are rather different. And so the first quote is a quote from Golda Meir, and both of these quotes are from the mid-1960s. And so before the 1967 war, but also before 1968 and all the changes it, it brought. And so they're quite timely. And the first quote is from Golda Meir. And Golda Meir says, Jews in general are not loved. Weak Jews are loved even less. In other words, she's suggesting that people will admire strong Jews. The second quote is from someone who you may or may not have heard of, but who's a, a philosopher who's had a huge influence on the what you could broadly call the intellectual left, and who's a Jewish philosopher called Emmanuel Levinas, who of, of Lithuanian origin, but lived most of his life in Paris, and who wrote some very important text from a purely philosophical point of view. And Livy Nash in the mid-1960s uh, was reflecting on uh, what had happened to the perspectives on Israel, mainly on the left. And he said here it was very surprising because the founders of the state, and I'm quoting from him, suddenly found themselves suddenly on the side of the colonizers. Israel's independence was immediately called imperialism, oppression of the natives, racism. For the first time in their history, the Jews found themselves thrown in with all that was reactionary. And, and so you have there a view that's really quite different from Golda Meir's view, but that turns out to be very important historically. Now, in thinking about how that process played out and what drove it, it's useful to remember that uh, the leaders of 1968, many of the leaders of 1968 were Jewish and were quite conspicuously Jewish. 
Um, so in France, you know, everyone knew Daniel Cohen-Brandit, uh, uh, everyone knew Alain Crevin. Uh, there was, it, it was almost to the point where uh, if you look at the, probably the 10 leading figures in May 68, uh, probably five or six of them were Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Benny Levy, who was uh, Sartre's uh, a research assistant, um, and so on. In, in, in the U.S., you had very significant figures, such as Carl Oglesby, who was the head of the Students for a Democratic Society, yeah. and many others who were who were. Jews, and even in Australia, Albert Langer, who was very prominent in the student movement, uh, was, even though he was an atheist personally, he was clearly from a Jewish background. And so what was the conception these people had of, of, of Judaism, and how did that percolate through into the left? And to understand that conception, it's it's useful to come back to a, a, an important figure called Isaac Deutscher. And Deutscher was a, basically a historian, philosopher, but a historian primarily. He was a, an admirer, though not a, a, a sort of signed up follower of Trotsky. And he wrote a very famous biography of Trotsky, a three volume biography of Trotsky. Um, but he gave a lecture in 1958 that then was widely picked up in after 1968, 10 years later, uh, about what he called the non-Jewish Jew. And the non-Jewish Jew was, to his mind, was the ideal Jew. Uh, it was the Jew who was a critical thinker, quote unquote, and he gave a long list of these that began with Spinoza, ran through Heinrich Heine, Marx and Freud. And he said what these people were doing was they were thinking through what authentic Jewish ethics were. And once they did that, he said, and this is a direct quote, um, their God was no longer the Jewish God. Spin and he, his example was Spinoza. God ceased to be Jewish. So that they were Jews who were not, in a way, Jewish. And who, as well as not being Jewish, use that non-Jewish perspective with which to be critical of the world they found. It was their criticism, their antagonism to it that was at the center of what he had to say. Uh, and that really defined the benchmark against which uh, the intellectual uh, left defined or redefined Jews and Judaism, breaking them down into two categories, good Jews and bad Jews. Uh, and the bad Jews were the Jews who sinned against this ideal. And I'll start with one example and then move quickly through a couple more, but uh, there's an Italian philosopher called Gianni Vattimo, who I'm sure none of you have heard of, but Vattimo was enormously influential. You'll find an Oxford companion to Vattimo, a Cambridge companion to Vattimo, a companion to Vattimo, and so on. And Vattimo uh, uh, said, well, the problem with Jews, he said, is that they, are, they don't want Judaism. Uh, in a way, that's a very old theme. I mean, this is the old theme that you find in, in, in Marx, for example, uh, as you find in Heidegger, of Jewish particularism. They want to retain what they have, which is their tradition, not necessarily in a deeply religious sense, because many Jews aren't horribly orthodox, but the tradition of Judaism. And so Vatimo, for instance, wrote in the 1980s, uh, just as the corruption and thirst for money and power of the Catholic Church has allowed us ex-Catholic to discover what the, the, the inquisitorial and colonial depravities of the past, uh, so too perhaps the bloody racist politics of the state of Israel 
had begun the, to push the Jewish community to take note that, and this I would emphasize, the very praiseworthy and profundity of the Jewish tradition is only so much putrid hot air. So the first sin that the bad Jews commit is that they, unlike Protestants, unlike the Catholics on the left, they remain in some identifiable sense Jewish. Okay? Then there's a second sin, and here I epitomize it by uh, another very influential left-wing writer called Enzo Traverso, who despite his Italian origins, teaches in France, but also in the US, and has had a big impact on American universities in particular. And Traverso says, well, not only do they retain their Jewish Judaism, but they abandon that critical approach to the world, uh, that harsh criticism of capitalism, colonialism, nationalism, that was the essence of Jewish brilliance. And so Traverso, uh, and I give some quotes in the handout, uh, says what's happened is that the leading Jewish intellectuals moved from what he calls the progressive camp to what he calls the camp of reaction and domination. Jews ceased to be Jews of critique and they became Jews of order. Uh, he, he, he cites as examples of Jews' critique against Spinoza, Trotsky, and then he, Deutscher, and he compares them oddly in a strange potpourri mix to, to uh, Kissinger, Raymond Daron, and Leo, Leo Strauss. And he says, well, the good ones chose the radical critique of power, the others chose power. And then he goes on to say, it was because they aligned themselves with that camp that they did effectively two things for which he blames them. The first thing is they, um, they gave rise to Islamophobia. And the second thing is that the rise of Islamophobia then induced uh, a Muslim reaction of Judeophobia. Now, what's interesting about this when he says it, and uh, I'll just read out a brief quote from him. He says, anti-Semitism has ceased pervading national cultures. So he says anti-Semitism has disappeared. And it's yielded its place to Islamophobia. And what year, dominant... was, uh, sorry, Henry, to interrupt. Uh, in what year was that uh, quote? Uh, this quote is from about uh, 1995. Mm -hmm. Okay. 1995. He says, anti-Semitism has ceased pervading national cultures. It's, as far as he's concerned, it's disappeared. It's yielded its place to Islamophobia. The dominant form of racism at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, note he uses the words racism in the context of Islamophobia, which implies that Islamophobia is not a reaction to anything Muslims do. It's just an irrational prejudice. It's like anti-Semitism, like Ooh. a hatred of Jews. Okay? And then he goes on to say, but it's also given way to a new Judeophobia engendered by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So the Judeophobia is not an irrational racism. Mm -hmm. It's a rational reaction to the events. Okay? And so you have the bad Jews, the bad Jews align themselves with reaction, and they induce the rise of Islamophobia. Mm. And then you have a third sin, and this sin is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and it's highlighted by uh, an intellectual called Judith Butler. And uh, Judith Butler, I said the others were very influential. Judith Butler is even more influential. Uh, Judith Butler is the founder of gender theory and of gender fluidity. So her first work was on why the notion of gender 
uh, should replace the notion of, of sex and why gender is fundamentally an, uh, uh, a category that uh, is socially constructed and can be socially deconstructed. Yeah? And uh, this made her immensely famous. She was the founder of, as I say, gender studies. She's the founder of queer theory. And she's also one of the most influential figures in the intellectual wing of the BDS movement. Um, and Butler is a serious thinker. Her, her work is uh, very erudite, uh, extremely complex, very jargon-ridden. Um, uh, uh, and as a result, she's up there on a significant intellectual pedestal, as it were. And she says, and Judith is, is herself of, from a Jewish family, though she's got nothing, no particular attachment to Judaism as such. Um, but she says that this turned to reaction and then uh, aggravated by uh, uh, the adoption of Zionism uh, has, has, has been associated with two very serious effects. The first effect, she says, is that Jews, because of their commitment to a tradition, reject the infinite plasticity of identity. Hmm? That it is an integral feature of being committed to Judaism, of being part of what she calls the Jewish world, that one cannot adopt the notion that identity is whatever you choose it to be. And she therefore has great difficulty with a quote uh, or a statement that was made by Hannah Arendt, who, of course, in other respects, she idealizes, because Hannah Arendt, when she was asked what Judaism meant to her and in what sense she was Jewish, she said, I have never pretended to be anything else or to be in any way other than I am. And I have never even felt tempted in that direction. It would have been, and this, of course, is anathema to Butler, it would have been like saying that I was a man and not a woman. That is to say, kind of insane. To me, to be a Jew belongs to the indisputable facts of life. And I have never had the wish to change or disclaim facts of this kind. And she goes on to say, not only that she doesn't wish to disclaim it, but there is such a thing as a basic gratitude for what has been given and not made. In other words, she reaffirms the importance of inherited, unchangeable identity. Yeah. That is obviously an anathema to Butler and to the contemporary left. But then Butler says there's something even more because what these bad Jews do is they adopt an inherently racist and inhuman ideology, which is Zionism. And Zionism, she says, has a quote-unquote structural commitment to state violence. It's an inherently violent ideology. Why is it inherently violent? It's inherently violent because it's committed to the nation state. And the nation state, in the end, is inscribed in and backed up by violence. And she cites as the example of just how far this goes, she cites again Emmanuel Levinas, whom in other respects she admires, a bit like Hannah Arendt, and she claims, quite contrary to the facts, that Emmanuel Levinas denies, because of his Zionism, that Palestinians are human. She says that in, in explicitly. But when you look at what Emmanuel Levinas actually said, Emmanuel Levinas, when you look at the actual statement that she cites in her footnote, what he says is, he says, yeah, he says it's an integral part of Judaism to feel an unbounded responsibility to others. 
But he then goes on to say, there's certainly a place for self-defense. If your neighbor attacks another neighbor, what can you do? Then we are faced with the problem of knowing who is right and who is wrong, who is just and who is unjust. There are, and this is his crucial reminder, there are people who are wrong in this world and who you have to deal with. And she says this is equivalent to denying the, uh, the, the humanity of Palestinians. This reaches an absolute extreme in the work of three other prominent left-wing intellectuals or three left-wing intellectuals, Santiago Zabala, who's Spanish, Jean Nibatim, who I cited a moment ago, and Alain Badiou, who's, who's French. And uh, according to Vattimo, um, uh, Zionism, which is the reflection of Judaism, obliterates its victims. Its mindset is, quote unquote, in essence the same as the fabrication of corpses in gas chambers and concentration camps. Israel, a fascist regime, therefore enacts policies that are Nazi, racist, colonialist, and imperialist. Mm. Okay? And Badiou echoes that and then says, uh, objects to the characterization of Nazi extermination of Jews as quote unquote radical evil, because he says by putting the Holocaust in that perspective of being the worst of worst, that prevents you from seeing that Jews are now doing to Palestinians what the Nazis did to Jews. So you have a chain of equivalence that goes from retaining commitment to Judaism, adopting reaction, adopting a, a philosophy that rejects the plasticity of identity and, and links itself into the nation state and to an inherited set of nationalism through to saying that's no different from what the Nazis were on about. And then you have the final inversion, which is this, that then if the bad Jews are no longer real Jews, they're no longer Isaac Deutscher's good Jews, i.e. the non-Jewish Jew, who today are the Jews, the Jews are the Palestinians. And so the chain of logic leads you to a point that was foreshadowed by Edward Said uh, many years ago in his book, Orientalism, where he said, um, the Jew of pre-Nazi Germany has bifurcated. What we now have is the Jewish hero, that is the bad Jews of today, who are all the Jews, who identify as Jews, okay? the Jew, and then his fearsome shadow, the Arab Oriental, i.e. the Palestinian. The Arab Oriental has taken the place in, uh, uh, in the Western imaginary that the Jews used to take. It's now, as he puts it, a shadow that dogs the Jew. And he goes to the point of saying the Jews themselves have so, have to such an extent abandoned what there is of worthwhile in Judaism that Said says he is the last Jewish intellectual. Said himself, <laughs> who is of course not Jewish, is quote unquote the yeah. last <clears throat> Jewish intellectual. Um, so that then leads you to the final point, which is this, and which is articulated by Judith Butler, um, that if the real Jews are not bad Jews, their adversary must be good guys, good Jews. Right? Because this is a world these people inhabit. It, it's a Manichean world in which there's a kind of moral narcissism uh, that only distinguishes good and evil, isn't capable of distinguishing anything other than two extremes. That's just like the narcissist, but it's a kind of moral narcissism. Uh, and that leads Judith to say that uh, yeah, there are the bad Jews out there. Okay? And so because we have to choose a camp, because everything is uh, uh, a contrast between uh, uh, the good people and the bad people, 
Okay? Uh, Hamas and Hezbollah are despite everything. Okay? That's what she says, despite everything, Hamas and Hezbollah, because she recognizes that they're not perfect. But she says Hamas and Hezbollah are social movements that are progressive. They're part of the, quote unquote, they are part of the global left. And hence, they're desirable. Hence, they're the people to, to back okay, in this great world conflict. And Vatimo goes even further and he says, well, if it is a great world struggle between us and them, which it is, and this is a textual quote from Vatimo, it would be a good thing if more Israelis were killed. Okay? Uh, and so you've gotten a chain of logic that leads you from uh, Deutscher's idealization of a type of Jew who was part of Judaism, but a relatively small part of Judaism, through to uh, the belief that today's Jews are not solely tarred by their association with Israel, but are tarred by reason of their commitment to Judaism. And that's a more fundamental anti-Semitism than just that which we sometimes associate with extreme forms of anti-Zionism. It's true anti-Semitism. Okay? And I'd like to end with just two quotes, both of which I think are, are a good summary of the situation. The first is uh, from uh, a French philosopher called Jean-Claude Miner. And Milner uh, uh, is uh, on the left. He's a sort of strange, his strange figure of the left, but he, who is uh, an important intellectual in France, a very important intellectual in France, because he was, uh, he's one of the great founders of French linguistics and linguistic theory and structural linguistics. And, and so on, and and he's he's a uh, uh, again a considerable philosopher in his in his own right, and uh, and Milner takes us his premise that in classical anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism of uh, uh, that was associated with fascism and its own way associated with Stalinism uh, and its attack on Jew as cosmopolitan. Uh, in classic anti-Semitism, the Jew was treated as symbolizing everything that was rotten in the modern world. And Milner says, well, in the contemporary left, we see a similar phenomenon. Okay? Uh, Jews, Israel, Zionism, but the Jews are the symbolic representation of everything that's illegitimate in today's world. And he says, and I'll quote him for a moment, if you'll forgive me, because he puts it so nicely, a left whose raison d'etre is to transgress all limits, including generational and sexual, could not tolerate the Jews who stand for a principle of limitation, generational transmission, and sexual difference. Israel and the Jews are no longer reviled as those who disrupt traditions and borders, which is the, the, the way they were in classic anti-Semitism, but as anachronistic, fossilized elements who disrupt the very disruption of all traditions and borders that is now fundamental to the Western's left project and worldview. In other words, having and to put it somewhat simplistically, but this captures what Milner has in mind, having with the great march of progressivism, having undermined, if not destroyed, traditional Catholicism, completely gutted traditional Protestantism, Judaism is the only thing left standing. And by its nature, it opposes uh, the, the transgression of all limits by its very nature. And then the second quote, which I think uh, 
acts as a nice capstone to that, comes from a French writer called Nathalie Azoulay, who says, yeah, that's true, but there are imaginary Jews the left loves. And she has a marvelous novel called Les Manifestations, which came out 20 years ago almost. And in it, I think it was her first book. In it, she talks about the divine left, the divine left, the left that, that has this divine mantle to it. Okay? And she says the distinction the divine left makes, and this is my translation, reflects the essence of the divine left itself. A hatred, and this brings us back to that quote from Golda Meir, a hatred for the Jews who stand up and fight, a preference for those clothed in rags, infected with typhus, and infested with lice. That's the ones they love, the real ones they now hate. So I'll leave it there, and I hope that's helped you understand some of the intellectual origins of the anti-Semitism that we now see on the radical left. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It's, uh, it's actually uh, an extraordinary presentation that you just made to us. And uh, I have to say, Henry, uh, I've never heard um, most of the concepts that you presented to us today have heard for the first time. And um, uh, I'm not familiar with Judith Butler. Certainly, I'm familiar with her concepts and her works. But uh, the way that you have been able to put it all together and in perspective, it's quite extraordinary. And I really want to thank you. And But, you know, can we need to ask you questions because all of that, of course, um, is agitating me, I'm sorry, <laughs> in some ways, and because uh, what you are describing here, of course, is uh, uh, all of those ideas, and we know that intellectually you can make mean anything, anything. And um, uh, we know, for instance, that uh, one of the flag word that is being agitated at the moment is the word genocide. And so can I ask you, first of all, can you, uh, you're familiar obviously with the etymology of that word, and can you take us a little bit through the history of that word and to take us where we are today with it in context of what you just said? Well, the word itself um, was uh, uh, famously coined in, in the 1940s, uh, and uh, it was it's a combination of a Greek and a Latin term, the Greek word for genus or for peoples and the extermination of, of peoples. And uh, when it was coined, um, uh, it was an attempt to respond to a famous statement by Winston Churchill. So in about 1942, I think it was, might have been early 1943, Churchill gave a speech about what was happening to Jews in Europe. And um, in his speech, he said what was happening was a crime without a name. So he, he talked about the extermination, mass killings, and he said, this is a crime that is, on, is of a new variety. And the term genocide was famously coined as an attempt to give that crime a name and also to, uh, uh, to uh, construct, as a result of naming it, a new class of crimes. Okay? And there had been moves in that direction in the 1930s to... Uh, try to formalize some notion of crimes against humanity. Um, the notion of crimes against humanity existed. It had been used in respect of the Armenian genocides, 1915. And, um, uh, uh, but it had never been formalized. And so the term uh, developed 
and then it was translated in 1948 into um, a UN instrument uh, beginning that was drafted in 1947 48, uh, defining the crime of, of genocide as uh, the destruction of a collective entity. And so the broad distinction was that crimes against humanity are crimes against individuals, but large numbers of individuals, and they involve trying to destroy large numbers of individuals, or in, in, in some sense, uh, destroy or in other ways, cripple or eliminate. Um, uh, whereas genocide referred to collectivities, so it was an entity. So the Holocaust was genocide because it was not just the killing of six million people, it was the extermination of the Jews as a collective entity. And that was broadly the distinguishing feature of genocide. Now, the peculiarity of it was that because the term um, was developed so as to define a new crime, it, it had an odd effect. Uh, and uh, the effect became visible very soon. And the effect was that, in a way, what it did was to relativize, if not eliminate, the uniqueness of the Holocaust. Okay? Because the Holocaust became just one member of this class of crimes, which was the crime of genocide. So you had the Holocaust, but you, know, you could, by definition, have other crimes of that type. That was the whole point. And this was not lost on a particularly... Uh, uh, um, the uh, the communist bloc, and especially Stalin and Molotov. And we know from the Soviet archives that Stalin himself went over successive drafts of the Genocide Convention okay, to look at what it might mean and how it might be used. And uh, there were two main results of that. Uh, one result was that uh, in the original drafts of the Holocaust, uh, sorry, of the Genocide Convention, um, there was a class of collectivity, which was political entities. So the extermination of political entities. Uh, and Stalin ensured that that was deleted because, for instance, the Holocaust of the Ukrainians was the Holocaust of a political entity, of a nation. Okay? And so the Genocide Convention uh, does not include or does not cover, if you imagine the Holocaust, uh, sorry, the genocide of the Kulaks, i.e. the so-called rich peasants in in Soviet Union, the equivalent that was done uh, at in the initial phases of uh, uh, the Chinese regime in the first waves of uh, of repression, 1950-53, uh, um, uh, extermination of the rich peasants, um, those were not genocides because they weren't a protected entity. Political categories were not a protected entity. If, if you imagine tomorrow the left having a holocaust of all the reactionaries, so Piers and I swing from lampposts, a genocide of the reactionaries. We all swing from lampposts. Well, that's too bad. It's not genocide, right? I mean, the reactionaries are not a protected entity for the purpose. But the second one, a uh, uh, consequence of that, was Stalin recognized that this term was labile. It could now be moved from one use to another. And so already in 1951, a Soviet front organization accused Israel of genocide. Okay. Uh, we tend to think that that's a recent development. Well, it isn't. It, it began uh, in the great Stalinist turn to anti-Semitism, uh, 
uh, after the Second World War, that almost immediately Israel was accused of genocide. At the very time when <laughs> the, the coordinating committee of the Arab League, or what became the Arab League, the Arab Coordinating Committee, was saying, don't worry, we're going to push all the Jews into the sea. Yeah? Um, uh, the, 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 the communist le uh, front organizations were accusing of genocide. And, of course, that then continued. So in the Korean War, the United States was accused of genocide uh, on the allegation that it had spread bacteriological entities carrying the plague into North Korea. This was completely imaginary. And when there was a need to give some proof of it, okay, a few prisoners, South Korean prisoners were selected. They were injected with the plague by Soviet doctors. And then their corpses were shown as the evidence that Americans were engaged in a genocidal attack on the Korean people. Equally, of course, then again in Vietnam and the Russell Tribunal accused and uh, um, uh, convicted the United States of genocide. Okay. Uh, but the great uh, uh, claims of genocide, the, 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 the great target of these claims was, of course, Israel. And uh, uh, there's a Norwegian scholar who has done a remarkable study of uh, the use of the term genocide in the Pragda and in Nizvezia, and he finds that um, the references to Zionism as genocide uh, from the 50s on absolutely dominate the pages of the, the use of the term genocide in the Pragda and in, 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 and, and in Izvestia. Now, all that, of course, posed a legal issue. Okay? Uh, I mean, if these things are genocide, then we have uh, in the Genocide Convention, you, the genocide is a, is a crime that uh, uh, ergo omnes, which means a crime that any country even if it's not directly affected by the genocide, a crime that any country can, can denounce to the International Court of Justice. Okay? It's, it's the only crime that's ergo omnis to the International Court of Justice. And, um, uh, uh, and that, uh, given that, uh, there was naturally the, the risk that the International Court of Justice would be drowned in genocide claims, but in fact, there weren't any to the International Court of Genocide, really until uh, the, uh, uh, the 90s. And in the 90s, there were two sets of events which were tangentially related to the International Court of Justice because they were ultimately dealt with through special tribunals that were empowered, which were the civil war in Yugoslavia in former Republic of Yugoslavia and the, uh, uh, the, the genocides in, in Africa, Rwanda and uh, Sierra Leone. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and in those cases, the question arose of, well, there's a, a, an element in the drafting notes for the Genocide Convention which say that it's important to distinguish genocides from war crimes. Okay? That war crimes are one thing and genocide is another thing. Okay? And, and that posed the question, well, you know, what do you do with allegations of genocide that occur in the course of conflict, such as the conflict that occurred in, in Srebrenica or in Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Croatia. Okay? And the rulings in the tribunals, which remained in place, uh, were that uh, you had an evidentiary hurdle. And the evidentiary hurdle was that when you looked at the facts of the case, the only possible explanation for what was being done, and they stress only, was genocidal intent. And 
Um, genocide is a crime of specific intent. In other words, it's a crime that requires you to show not just a general purpose, but that there was the specific intention to commit genocide. However, you can infer that from the conduct if the only possible explanation for the conduct is that it was motivated by a desire to commit genocide. And that's the fundamental difficulty with what's happening at the moment. So there are two processes that are actually very different. One process is all these accusations of genocide that we hear being made, for instance, by even some labor ministers. Okay? They are not using the term in any particularly meaningful sense, be it substantively uh, in terms of the way it was originally framed or legally. Mm -hmm. And then we have a legal process, which is underway at the International Court of Justice. And um, as some of you, are, as, as you may know, the Irish have now submitted uh, a statement to the International Court of Justice asking it to change this evidentiary hurdle, to get rid of the evidentiary hurdle. And so genocide could be found even, in the, even if it is not the only explanation for the conduct. That's a very significant development. It will open the floodgates. And if the court adopts that, which it may well, then it's very likely to convict Israel of genocide. And hence, we will end up with the exact opposite with what Lemkin, Ralph Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin, who framed the term and whose family was killed in the Holocaust, the very opposite of what he intended. He said, and he said this in exactly these terms or close to it, uh, this will be a bulwark against future Holocausts. Uh, that bulwark will become the facilitator of a future Holocaust that is uh, the extermination of the people of Israel. Yes. Um, that is uh, quite compelling, uh, what you just said. Um, but of course, if that new definition is adopted, then any conflict that involves any killing of any civilian becomes a genocide. So well, conflicts of war have become impossible. Well, they don't, I mean, they don't become impossible. It just means that they run the risk of being accused of genocide. And, be ge genocide. and there's no like that. There's no, there's, there's, you know, there's every likelihood that, for instance, if you look at the war in Iraq, the American war in Iraq, that that would be classed as genocide. Yeah. What Australia participated in Afghanistan would be classed as genocide. But of course, uh, you won't, we, we won't expect to see the Australian government object to this change in the evidentiary hurdle. Well, the mm. current government, maybe not, um, but hopefully any future government may. Um, but Henry, all of that comes to one uh, tool in the, in the toolbox of all those linguists, uh, and that's postmodernism. Uh, without postmodernism, none of what you described is possible, right? Well, the, the problem, look, I, I always hesitate with the term postmodernism because um, it's extremely difficult to know quite what it means. Right, uh, in terms I, of the uh, relative I, 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 truth, uh, no, no, you know, uh, uh, there is no wrong, no. there is uh, no right, uh, and no. so it's the disintegration of the traditional moral. Yeah, it's it's a it's, look it, interpreted that way. It's an extreme form of relativism, right? I mean, yeah. it's an extreme form of relativism, but. Um, uh, I've, look, personally, the, the number of people I know, and I know quite a few people who are regard themselves, and rightly so, as 
very scholarly, but number of people I know who actually read and understood or think they've understood Derrida or Deleuze or Lyotard mm. or any of these postmodernists is very, very small, right? Because they're, they're very, it's quite difficult to figure out exactly what, what they're saying. Uh, but yeah, I mean, isn't the the interpretation the of the in professors the, 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 in in those woke universities that uh, teach Derrida that make it mean uh, what it perhaps does not mean? Yeah, so, I, and and, and mm. you know, Derrida himself was not antipathetic to Israel. I mean, Derrida was not the antipathetic to Zionism. Um, but but that said, I think what what the what has what has happened in different ways is, uh, is precisely as you suggest, Albert, uh, a decline in, the, in, in related notions of, of factual truth and of objectivity as being the quest for some kind of truth. Objectivity as being not merely an intellectual virtue, but an intellectual duty. Okay? And that's, an, that's a, a very important development. In fact, I think in some respects, the abandonment of the notion of objectivity as a virtue is every bit as important, if not more important, than relativism, which has always existed. Okay? Um, and uh, uh, what is involved, and the two are, are, are naturally related, and perhaps the best way of seeing them in terms of the intellectual history of recent years is in terms of a historian and, and theorist of history called Hayden White, who's an American. Uh, and Hayden White, who, uh, was influential in arguing that, well, historical truth, you know, depends on the question you ask. Uh, it's difficult to ascertain. Uh, it, by its nature, as the questions change, perhaps it changes and so on and so forth. And then Hayden White in the late 1980s, and he was very influential in these, in this sort of, uh, questioning of the notion of historical facticity and historical truth, Hayden White in the late 1980s was confronted with the fact that his arguments were being used by Holocaust deniers. And so there's a famous conference at Berkeley on, on, on this issue, and Hayden White was asked about this, and and then he revised the preface to his most important work in the light of it. And he said, yeah, well, he said, so how do you, he said, the fundamental question that raises how, is, how do you know what is the right truth? Okay? If there are possible truths, if there are possible truths, how do you know what is the right truth? And the right truth, Hayden White said, is the truth that has the right effect. Mm. And so since it's a bad thing to deny the Holocaust, it isn't true. And since it's a good thing to say that the Holocaust occurred, then that is true. Now, that then shaped the intellectual milieu in which people like Michel Foucault, who were writing similar things at that time, or Bourdieu later wrote. Right? And what it said was, how do I, in this world where Karl Popper was right, finding the truth is hard, all sorts of perspectives, okay, how do I know what the right truth is? I ask myself, what is the truth that does good? Okay? And the truth that does good is obviously a truth that advances my cause. Hmm. Okay? That is... And that is such a fundamental change from the whole notion that uh, what the duty of 
intellectuals is is to dispassionately and objectively seek what is real okay, that it had very wide ranging and in my view calamitous effects. yeah so henry in the 40s uh, anti-Semitism culminated with the Holocaust of Jews. Uh, Hitler didn't have all the tools, uh, the intellectual tools that you're describing from uh, uh, Judith Butler uh, and others. Uh, where does this end in this uh, in, in this era? How is all of this going to end? Well, I think this needs to be seen in a broader context, Albert. Um, to my mind, uh, there's a fundamental difference between uh, September 11 and October 7, in this sense that September 11 highlighted a fault line between the West and the rest. Okay? A very deep but real fault line. October 7 highlighted a very deep fault line within the West. Uh, the, uh, the barbarians are not at the gates, uh, they're in the streets, in our streets. And, uh, and uh, being in our streets, they help tear those streets apart and tear societies mm -hmm. apart. And this, of course, isn't, isn't uh, just a phenomenon of anti-Semitism, it's much broader. It's, it's the uh, culmination, or at least the outcome, of uh, trends that have been underway for some time and that involve uh, uh, the uh, a, a, a vast shift to self-hatred, a vast shift to self-hatred and to hatred of all those who oppose that self-hatred within Western societies. In Australia, I think where we first saw this in dramatic form was actually with the trial of Cardinal Pell. Mm. I think the trial of Cardinal Pell was an absolutely pivotal moment in that, in, in that intellectual change. Uh, uh, and it was extraordinary. I mean, as Pierre's and others know all too well, uh, it was extraordinary. It was, if you said anything that sounded even vaguely like you were defending Cardinal Pell or just asserting the presumption of innocence, okay, um, you, you were reviled. Uh, it got to the point where the Australian, I remember I read some columns and they wouldn't allow comments. They couldn't allow mm. comments because the moment they allowed comments, the paper was drowned. Okay. Then we saw that again with climate change. Mm. The people who in any way expressed doubt, not necessarily even about the science, but just about the, the policies. Okay. What were they called? Climate deniers, Absolutely. like Holocaust deniers. It was as bad as Holocaust deniers. Okay. So that plastic term, denial, just like genocide, these terms of infinite plasticity came in. But him, then we yeah. saw it again, more recently, with the referendum. Okay. Uh, the people who argued the no case uh, weren't just wrong, they were evil. They were profoundly evil. And, and that was very convenient, as all of these cases have been very convenient, because once you moralize a dispute, you no longer need to give cogent intellectual reasons. Mm. Okay? And what was striking in the referendum was that you would raise arguments and you'd get no response. You just get the response that it's misinformation or disinformation or it's racism or whatever, right? 
epithets instead of argument. And and now we see it with October 7. It's exactly the same mindset. A Anna Freud once made a very insightful comment about hatred. And she, of course, had experienced it before they left Austria. Um, and her comment about hatred was to say that there's a fundamental difference between love and hate. That if you love someone, it's a personal attachment. Okay? But hatred, she thought, was a form of neurosis or neurotic aggression okay? that was inherently labile. It, 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 it was always searching for new things to hate. And it could be transferred from one item or one target to another in the way that love cannot be. Okay? And that's what we've seen is this transfer of hatreds. Where will it all end, you ask, Albert? I mean, to my mind, it's a question of whether we can turn that back or not. And if we can't turn that back, well, it's very difficult to say, you know, what form will bad things take? Uh, it, it will be catastrophic. Well, uh, here's Henry, you... have, uh, yes, I was going to invite you to ask uh, Henry uh, the question that is burning your lips right now. Well, I was just going to, uh, Albert, thank you. Uh, uh, Henry, thank you very much. I was extremely taken with your exposition on this chain of equivalence that has has taken place. At, at, but it strikes, strikes me that as you quote from these various people who obviously hold important positions in our universities here globally, publish widely and are followed everywhere, this this chain of equivalence and how how possibly can these distortions of fundamental intellectual truths um be be accepted in as much as they're so they're so irrational. I mean, these people are basically spelling out uh, um, contradictory uh, arguments um, going back to the to the pre revolutionary days in Russia, uh, and and yet we see them now being accepted. And as you say in the Pell case. We see the police, first of all, in Victoria. Then we saw the judiciary in Victoria uh, accepting um, uh, hypotheticals um, as solid evidence upon which to um, lay charges. Um, you, you mentioned uh, then this long list of people who stand, uh, who question, merely question, various government policies being branded as deniers, one you missed out, of course, was people who, who actually questioned some of the policies which uh, were enforced upon the Australian people in various states with various degrees yeah. um, during, during COVID. COVID. And mm. we've just had this COVID um, inquiry, which was essentially a whitewash as it found that nobody in any state was responsible. And what's more, the the various um, directors of state health departments. One's now the governor of Queensland. Another is now being given a, a, a second serious appointment in Victoria. Um, this thing just rolls on with its its own momentum, uh, and the numbers of people who stand up against uh, and say this is this is absolute nonsense. This is humbug. This is empty. Um, are, are diminishing. I, you know, I, you say, where, how does it turn? Well, of course, there are some polls in America which show that young um, young men between eighteen and twenty four are, are, are rebelling against the uh, policies that have been uh, enunciated by uh, Kamala Harris, but. Um, and, and there are various other movements between young conservatives around the world, I, I note. Um, but it, it is, it's just so alarming. I mean, there was yet another anti-Semitic uh, dis uh, display in, 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 in Caulfield in Melbourne um, yesterday, Monday. 
um, where two gentlemen jumped on a bus full of young women from a Jewish girls' college and started uh, giving Hitler salutes and calling out Heil Hitler and muttering other things. And yet the, um, uh, the police seemed more concerned and the politicians in Australia have been, well, they haven't condemned uh, really any of these examples of anti-Semitism, mm. nor, nor have there been um, significant charges laid. No, it, look, I all I can say is I entirely agree, Pierce. Yeah. Of course, there's another instance again of this demonization, which is the whole issue associated with gender. I mean, that's yes. again an area where if you say that you don't believe in gender fluidity, you're immediately tarred with the brush of being worse than reactionary. You're evil because you want to condemn the, these young kids of whom there are apparently millions who think they're women, although they're boys or think they're whatever, right? Um, and uh, instead of, again, rational argument, you say, how, how is it that these people can believe these things? Um, well, in their mind, they have a logical argument. Uh, it's just it's a logical argument that's not a very good argument, right? <laughs> and also... There's another aspect to it, which is, I think, quite significant. And that comes back to Albert's point about postmodernism or mm. fact relativism, which is that they never feel the need to really test these statements empirically. So you, you look at someone like Judith Butler or Vatimo even more so, or even Eza Traverso, um, uh, they, they know virtually nothing about the history of the Middle East. And they're not right. particularly interested in it. Henry, one one last mm -hmm. question. I'll leave the floor to others. Should Donald Trump win in tomorrow's uh, election, do you think that there is a possibility that some of this may be wound back in America? Um. Look, I think, uh, I mean, it's very, you know, with Trump, as with Harris, it's very difficult to say exactly what they will do and what, they, what they're thinking and what they stand for and what the reaction to it will be. But in terms of Trump, I think, on the contrary, I think a, not, 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 not because of anything Trump himself does, but I th think the reaction on the left to a Trump victory will be worse than, than indignation. Mm -hmm. It will be, it, it will be an extreme form of outrage. And what we'll see is, or what we risk seeing is uh, 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 an extreme reaction. Uh, um, you know, uh, I mean, there's, the statement out there that, um, and I'm sure you know this as well as I do, that um, that if Trump doesn't win, there'll be riots, which suggests that if Trump does win, there won't be riots. Well, I don't believe that for a moment. Mm. Um, mm. I mean, after all, some of the worst rioting we had in recent years was from the Black Lives Matter movement. Right? It yeah. wasn't from, I mean, yes, January 6th shouldn't, not have happened, no doubt about that. Right? But that was bad as that was. That was nothing compared to what happened with Black Lives Matter, mm. where whole neighborhoods were burnt down. Okay? Mm. And um, uh, uh, and I suspect it's the risk is of that kind of conflagration um, in the event of a very narrow. It looks like it would be an extremely narrow Trump victory. Years and years ago, uh, uh, an unlikely source, but a reliable one nonetheless, Stokey Carmichael, mm. who was one of the leaders of Black Power Movement, Black Panthers, and so on. Stokey Carmichael was hauled up for something. I can't remember what it was. And he was in court and he said, Hey, he said, rioting is as American as apple pie. 
And um, and there's a, an element of truth to that. I mean, it's it's not an accident that the U.S. Constitution, unusually, has a clause that allows the federal government to send in troops when state capitals are besieged. Hmm? Mm. Um, in, in the event of insurrections affecting state capital buildings. Right? Um, yeah. And the reason for that is that there's that undercurrent there. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the great tricks of the American quote-unquote progressives to have somehow convinced people that this is a Trump phenomenon. Yeah. That the yeah. Trumpies are the ones who are going to be out there. Well, no, it's it, they, they, they've already proven that they can do it just as well. Michael Leeson, welcome to the discussion. Michael? His are you phone's on, on mute. Are you muted, uh, Michael? Can you unmute? Uh, you? Yes. Hi, Michael. Uh, do you mind uh, turning on your camera so we can see your beautiful face, or it's not possible? Can you hear me at all? Yeah, we can hear you now. Can, we can hear me. We can uh, yeah. see you. Look, we I'm, can I'm, see. Using my, I'm using my iPhone, and I'm not sure how to uh, oh, see, turn okay. on my camera. <laughs> my apologies. Um, but, uh, look, I was going to ask a question about the university, and uh, whereas many of the demonstrators might have read Judith Butler and understood the idea of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and the way that's all been perverted um, at Harvard and other places. In Australia, you couldn't accuse Mark Scott or Belinda Hutchison of having read very much at all. And yet they've been very benign in the way that they've treated the outburst of uh, occupation and anti-Semitism on campuses. And those examples can be extended to other universities. How do you explain that? I, I, I just find the usual suspects of mad lefties, and many of them are students who are demonstrating on campus, um, bound up with all of what Henry has described is uh, very telling. But how do you explain the university administrator? And in Australia, unlike um, Harvard and elsewhere in the US in that famous congressional interrogation, um, where you could see the DEI had influenced their thinking. But here it happens, but they've not done anything about the outburst of anti-Semitism. How do you explain that, Henry? Because that, I find, one of the most surprising aspects, along with the police not doing much, if anything, uh, in terms of uh, arresting uh, demonstrators. I, I find that some of the two most writing and horrible aspects of the post-October 7th world in Australia is the lack of police action and the university administrators being uh, very weak. Okay, Henry. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly agree with you, Michael, on just how shocking those phenomena are. There's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, then there's the question of of how you how you explain it, um, and it's it's in some respects quite puzzling, right? Uh, and it's puzzling because we are coming from a background where or a situation where um, uh, the basic notion of administration seems to be that you try to keep everyone happy. Right? So what's a good administrator? An administrator is someone who, 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 who worries about anyone being upset. Okay? Um, and upsetting people is bad. Okay? Um, uh, um, and uh, it's like running a, a sort of a kindergarten. Okay? And, and, and everyone's the, uh, the sort of emotional equivalent of a, of a child. You, you, you don't want to bruise them because... Uh, if you bruise them, that might destroy their personality, 
poison their life. Mm. Um, and and so you say, well, okay, well, if that's the basic notion that you know everyone has to be nice to everyone, why do we allow these people who are clearly not being nice to another group of people? Why do we allow them to get away with it? Huh? Um, and uh, um, uh, and to my mind, what, has, what is at issue there is uh, a combination of, of factors. I think one factor is that uh, these uh, administrators, of whom there's uh, now an enormous number in the universities and very well paid, enormous number in the universities, um, it's been the main growth in university staffing has been in managerial and administrative positions, but particularly senior managerial positions. Um, so uh, that these, uh, 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 these, the people running uh, these universities um, don't want to be seen to pick sides. They just, they just don't, don't want to be involved in a conflict. And so they think, well, okay, um, we'll we'll just, you know, we'll we'll do the minimum that needs to be done. And obviously, if someone assaults someone else, then that's one thing. But if it's short of that, then let them do what they want to do. I think they also uh, underestimated the persistence. I think they believed, like lots of people, that, well, there'll be three days of this and then it'll be the exam session and all these people will go away because they'll be studying for their exams. Right? And so they thought, well, we'll just ride it out and then it'll go away. And, and that's not at all what was ever going to happen. But that was a, a genuine mistake they made. Uh, I, I think also that they're petrified of being accused of Islamophobia. Absolutely petrified of that. Okay. Uh, and you see that with Mark Scott. Um, uh, uh, but there's a final element that I think is really significant. And that element is that they have no idea what running a university means. <laughs> yeah. Um, that uh, uh, the, the essence of a university, and, and Max Weber was very clear on this, as when he was in a long tradition before and after, that universities are there to do two things, to seek and to teach the truth. Okay? Academic freedom is the freedom to seek the truth, it's the freedom to teach the truth, and it's the freedom to learn the truth. And Weber put as much emphasis on the freedom to learn as on the freedom to seek. And what the freedom to learn meant was that you had campuses that were safe, to use the current buzzword, but where it was clear that there was a learning atmosphere, that they were suited to their function, and that everything which was antithetical to that function right, was not an instance of academic freedom, it was a violation of academic freedom. And so when when these protesters prevent Jewish students from speaking or attending lectures, when the protesters insist that they be given the right to lecture other students, as has happened at Latrobe, and was granted by the administration at Latrobe, those are not exercises of academic freedom. They are the burial of academic freedom. And anyone who understands what a university is about knows that. But our problem is 
that virtually none of our administrators today have any idea of what universities are for. Thank you, Henry. Alan Howe, hmm. well, welcome, finally. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry, there was a, a, a tree fell across the railway line um, in between my station, Castle Main, and the previous one. So they cancelled one service, and then mine ran, which was an hour later anyway, ran another half hour later than that. I'm very sorry. But these things happen when you live in the bush. And um, can I ask no, a question? And, of and, can... and there is no relative truth right there. <laughs> Not too sure I get that. Um, well, a, tr a tree fell. A tree fell on the line, and people were there to, to experience it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I would have been there with a, in a chainsaw. With a, I've got two chainsaws just there. Um, <laughs> I would have chopped that. Piers, you and I could have chopped that tree in half, in three pieces, and got rid of the offending pieces, which would only be the width of a railway line, which we could pick up jointly, in about ten minutes. Um, well, Alan, 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 if I if I can butt in for one second on relative truth, there's a very nice statement. There's a great French philosopher called Jacques Bouvares, who very eminent French philosopher, and who was a, actually a, a friend of Derrida's. They had been to uh, France's most prestigious tertiary institution, the École Normale Supérieure. They both went to the École Normale Supérieure, and. Um, Derrida was carrying on about the you know insubstantial notion of of a fact. And Bouvresse said to him, you know, Jacques, even Professor Derrida needs to know whether his next flight to an academic conference in the United States leaves on Tuesday at 3 p.m. or on Thursday at 5 p.m. <laughs> 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 yeah, so much for relative truth. Henry, can I ask you a question, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I've I've written about this, but um, you, you don't get a, a, a you know a second chance to make a first impression. And on October the ninth last year, and appears was probably in Paddington, probably in the city. So Jews were warned of, of, uh, against going to the uh, the. Opera House because it was to be illuminated in the colours of the Israeli flag and so were uh, other sites around the world including the Eiffel Tower, the Brandenburg Gates, uh, 10 Downing Street um, but, uh, and only one was there a, a riot um, and that was in Australia um, and the Jews were told um, don't attend uh, because we can't guarantee your safety which sounds to me like a, a state police force picking and choosing who they'll defend but Beyond that, um, presumably, the Chief Commissioner of Police, and Piers may know more about this than me, the Chief Commissioner of Police received that information from the police minister. I assume that's how that works. Now, the the, the, the a, a cavalcade drove from Lakemba to the Opera House and parked illegally. They already had large batons out of their cars, which is illegal itself, uh, with Palestinian flags, and they then went and committed... In, you know, innumerable criminal acts over the course of three hours. Uh, and that's where we had the chance of fuck the Jews and where's the Jews. Um, and at, at one stage, of course, it was said, gas the Jews. Um, I reckon you could have walked around there with a can of Zyklon B and nobody would have said a word to you. Um, but did we lose the opportunity to, to you know, grab it, uh, grab it, that, that opportunity? Did we lose the opportunity to nip this in the bud? Uh, you know, in the way that when... The Springboks played in Melbourne in 1971. Mm -hmm. Riot police were there in uniform with shields, with batons and with horses and they suppressed the riot and a football game went ahead. doesn't matter what you think about the rightness of that, um, but they, they, they stamped their authority on the event. And in New South Wales on October the 9th last year, before much had happened, certainly from the Israeli side, we didn't. Yeah. Oh, I think that's... That's certainly correct, Alan. Um, now, you, know, you can argue about exactly how they should have done it, but what is clear is that the police should have done much more than they did, They're, that there were two basic faults. First of all, the role of the police 
is to ensure that there aren't places where Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, atheists, whoever, cannot go because they'll be at risk. Okay? That's, that's what they exist for. And if they can't do that, they too don't no longer understand their function. And I think that's, that's, that's really, again, part of the problem. I think this loss of understanding of what institutions are for and what authority means is, is the broader context in which these phenomena occur. Mm -hmm. So that's the first fault, was to not understand and carry out their function. And I think the second fault was to, at that point, not make it clear that there were some limits to what could be done. Uh, to my mind, there's a, this pernicious idea uh, that has developed in Australia, and I think it's absolutely pernicious, as I said, which is the idea that there's something called the right to protest. Right? And there's certainly a freedom of assembly, and it's a very important right, the freedom of assembly. And uh, it's a, a freedom that comes with an opportunity to express your views once you are lawfully assembled. But there's no right as such to create a nuisance to other people. In fact, even the right of assembly has always been constrained. Okay? You don't have a right to just stand in the middle of a crowded bridge, of Sydney Harbour Bridge, okay, and bring the traffic to a stop. That's not an expression of the right of assembly. But somehow, and you see this in Mark Scott's extremely confused pronouncements, okay, uh, anything that is done in the course of a protest is merely the exercise of this right to protest, even if it imposes risks and a nuisance on others. And that, that has never been the case. And the police had at that point an opportunity to make that clear, and they gave up that opportunity. And once they had done that, then of course it was very difficult to reverse. There's a precedent that's interesting, though obviously different times, different approaches, which is this. I believe, look, and I'll, I'll get the date wrong, but my, my belief is that it was in the late 1850s, but I, I may be wrong on the date. Um, there, there was a, a, a clash between uh, essentially Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants in Melbourne. And it was a riot. And it was the, probably the deadliest riot in Australian history. Okay? Because I think the Orange Order was, was right. parading and they had their banners. And the, there were some Catholics who were also counter-demonstrating and they had their own uh, uh, banners of some kind. And they had guns because at that time many people had guns and they shot and I think 13 people were killed. Okay, so a significant number of deaths. There was a material number of deaths. It wasn't a huge death toll, but there were many dead and far greater number wounded. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the state parliament immediately passed a law banning demonstrations for a period of time, banning any display of flags, signs, or symbols that promoted division. And, and the situation quieted down. Now, that's not to say that the underlying causes of conflict disappeared, because they obviously didn't, and it resurfaced periodically. 
But there was a very strong immediate response. And not understanding that, again, comes back, and let me just cite one example here, and I know how about that we're running out of time, which is there was, to my mind, a very foolish statement by Mike Burgess, yeah. the head of Asia, where he said after those events, October 9th, maybe a month or two later, he said, well, it's better let those things run because they... Uh, they let out the steam. They let off steam. Okay? And if you allow them to proceed, then that takes the wind out of the event uh, and uh, avoids uh, greater and, and, and more harmful confrontations. I think the exact opposite is true. I think what happens is that it empowers, it creates a sense of momentum, it creates a dynamic. And once that dynamic gets underway, then it can lead to a spiral effect. And I believe that all of the academic research is consistent with that. I have no idea what basis Burgess made his statement on, because I'm entirely unfamiliar with any research that bears it out. And had they taken that opportunity, as you suggest, Alan, I think a great deal of harm would have been avoided. Well, Henry, I want to thank you for this great uh, discussion. Thank you for sharing your great knowledge about those topics that you are uh, mastering. And um, I can confirm, by the way, that um, Eugene Kontorovich, we will finally have him uh, on the 19th of October, I invite you all to come and join be because we will be talking about adjacent topics to what we discussed today, uh, which is uh, those famous uh, law fairs at uh, the United Nations uh, against Israel and now against the Prime Minister and the, for and the, the um, uh, Minister of Defense. Uh, so it will be a very interesting topic. Again, Henry, Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you all for participating. And uh, I will see you again very soon. And thank, thank you very much, Albert and Pierce and Michael and Alan. I very much thanks, appreciate thanks, your everyone. listening today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bonne chance.